very sense who will tell you how to maintain strong working ethic, how to invest wisely, and how to uh, generate greater income. After the session, um, Jana will introduce the winner of the photography competition. So enjoy tonight. Thank you. So good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, can everybody at the back hear me? Do I? Yeah, that's good. That's good. If you fall asleep, I know I'm, I'm getting there. Um, thank you so much for inviting me along tonight. I looked with horror when I saw this poster. <laughs> Learn from the, the best. I'm going to put this on social media tonight because I know everybody who knows me is going to say, What? Are you kidding? <laughs> Invest wisely. Generate greater wealth. My goodness. <laughs> <laughs> we, we try, we try. So ladies and gentlemen, tonight I'm going to tell you a little bit about my background, where I came from, how I got involved in business, how I grew a business from very small beginnings to uh, selling that business in 2012, and kind of what I've been doing since then and the new businesses I've been getting involved with, and probably more importantly, just to point out one thing to you, that I was one of you back in 1985. 1985 I went to Edinburgh University and did a business and law degree. So I guess I thought to myself, my goodness, I wish entrepreneurs came and spoke to me when I was at university. I had these lecturers who talked all these theories about business and it's great to hear from somebody who's kind of done it and, and you know, and I'm going to talk about some of those key things that you are learning in the classroom and how they relate to actually what happens when you actually run a business. Um, so I'm going to talk for maybe 30 or 40 minutes. Um, what I then want to do is open the floor to questions. And I love questions because that really gets me going and it makes it a little, 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 little more interesting. So please feel free at that point to ask, ask what you will. So, my name is David Sands. Um, I was born in Kinrosshire, um, which is just north of Edinburgh, and I lived literally above a family shop in a little village called Glen Farg. So, like Lady Thatcher, I was born and brought up above the, the shop. And I guess, like a lot of entrepreneurs, um, my dad was a lot more than, than just a shopkeeper. He was and still is an entrepreneur. And so, you know, I was brought into, I was the oldest of the family, there's four of us, and uh, it was very much a family business. We moved to Kinross, which was only five miles away. It seemed a big trauma at the time when you're five years old, but we were brought up in the business. So my dad had all sorts of adventures and being an entrepreneur and money-making schemes when he was younger, and the family were dragged into it. To give you an example, when I was about six years old, I used to go and help pick Brussels sprouts, because my dad decided there was a market in Brussels sprouts. Oh, God, there wasn't. There wasn't a market in Brussels sprouts, and it was a complete waste of time. But before school, we used to go and pick Brussels sprouts, which you could then sell in the shop. What I will say about family businesses and small family businesses are you have to work very hard, um, really hard. And, and I guess from an early age, I would be watching what my parents were doing and what they were doing. And, and you know, we talk about work ethic. Um, I really do believe in that very strongly. Uh, there are few, few people who are successful in life uh, unless they work really, really hard at it. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So. When I was about 11, 12 years old, my dad said, right, you're having enough fun now. It's time you came and worked in the shop. Uh, my first job working in the shop when I was 12 years old, I used to bag potatoes. They used to come in in great big bags from a, tra a trailer, a tractor trailer, brought in and I used to bag them up and, and we would sell them in the shop. First job. Second job was mopping a floor. <coughs> Um, and it, it, this is important. Learning to mop a floor is important, uh, as I will tell you later on in the story. So by the time I was 16, my dad was very much involved with me in the business. He would discuss things with me. He would say, we're going to do this, what do you think about that? I was running shifts in, in the store. The store was a very successful store in Kinross. It was one of the best, if you like, independent retail 
uh, food stores, um, it, it was going great. Um, round about 16, I think I probably would have left school if I'd had my way, to be quite honest. Although I was doing okay at school, I was never that interested, if, to, if I'm really honest. If I'm honest, around about 16, my ambition was to make a lot of money. And I, <laughs> I say that because I'm not sure it's a really popular thing to say nowadays. It seems, oh, that's terrible, and all this food banks and all that kind of stuff. Actually, when I was 16, and for many years after that, my ambition was to make money. I make no apology for it. That's what I wanted to do. I was really clear on that. I wanted to make a lot of money. So just bear in mind that that's sitting there. And I struggled to see what going on to further education was going to do other than hinder me in getting on with making money. My dad was good though. He said, no, go, go and learn somewhere else. Go and take some time, enjoy life for a few years. Uh, you'll get plenty of opportunities to work. Um, needless to say, when I was a student, I had a job. I worked at Saver Centre in Cameron Toll. And uh, obviously, the, the, that, that was a, a, a joint company, Sainsbury's and British Home Stores at the time. And I learned an awful lot working there, actually, as, as a student. Um, but I got my degree. Uh, I did three years. No, I didn't do an honours degree. I, by the end of three years, I had absolutely had enough. And I think university had, had enough of me as well. And it was a good parting of the ways. So what I did then was I joined uh, Sainsbury's as a graduate trainee. I went down to London, and I guess that, to be honest, is where my education re really started. And I got to the store, and you can imagine stores in South London, and London in general, you know, I walked in thinking I'm a graduate, you know, this is good. And when I walked in, the first thing, I met the store manager, and he said, what the fuck are you doing here? <laughs> I said, well, that's what I was told to come. That's what I was told to come. Well, he said, I don't need a graduate. He says, you're completely useless to me. Do you think I've got any time to show you what to do, etc., etc." He said, and here's where the, mop the floor comes in, he said, can you mop a floor? I said, yeah, I've done that. He said, right, go and mop that. So my first job at Sainsbury's was mopping a floor while this enraged manager went to find out who on earth I was and why did he not know anything about me. But I will say by the end of 12 months that that manager meant an awful lot to me and he to he, and I think me to him as well. I learned a huge amount from him. And you know, one of the things I would say to you all is that you will find some people in your life who you can really learn from. <laughs> Attach yourself to them, listen to them, and, and you will develop as people. So, so Mr. Reynolds back in Sainsbury's Garrett Lane um, was a real mentor to me um, in, in, in every sense. And I, I learned a lot, and I'll tell you what happened. After about a week, he realised that I could actually do a little bit more than mop on the floor. And on a Saturday afternoon, this was a store which turned over, over a million pounds a week. And that in the 1980s, that was and still is a lot of money. We had a big staff. He handed me the keys at four o'clock on a Saturday afternoon. He said, right, you're in charge. Now, we had... Oh, Saturdays are busy in London. They're busy every day in London, but it was busy. Do you imagine, I'm 21 years old, I've been there a week, and he left me and he gave me the keys, you're in charge. Oh, my God. So, I'm wandering about the shop floor, thinking... That'll be fine, everybody knows what they're doing. Leadership, let's take a step back, keep out of the way, you know, all those sort of things. And somebody pressed a panic alarm. Oh my goodness, I don't need this. And in the you know, 10 minutes, I phone the store, this, this, this is before mobiles, so you don't. Who are you going to phone? Are you going to phone head office? <laughs> uh, that's not going to happen. Turns out somebody's having a heart attack in one of the aisles. So day, day one of David's responsibility was dealing with a heart attack. Um, and, you know, dealing with that, thankfully, when they survived. <laughs> I don't know, but I really... It just shows so responsibility in that kind of job comes very, very quickly. Can do. And uh, it's, you know, are you, going to be able, are you able to step up to that plate or not? Um, it's okay to have doubts. <laughs> but it, it does happen. And, you know, I would encourage you all about that. And I, I will say, you know, working for Sainsbury's at the time... It was a fabulous company, and as much as 
with any big company, there are huge opportunities. And if you show willing, work hard, um, you really can advance yourself quite quickly. And I believe that's tr as true nowadays as it was then. Um, but I go back to, you have to work hard. And uh, maybe something just to put in context with that. When I joined St. Bruce as a graduate trainee, there was about 40 trainees all from different degree disciplines who joined Sainsbury's at the same time in the South East area. After a year, there was five of us left. Most of them couldn't hack it. Uh, you just couldn't hack the pace of retailing. Um, so, it wasn't because they were dismissed, it's because they couldn't deal with it. So, really high burnout rate there. Personally, I thought Sainsbury's should have been developing the people who maybe joined them from school and developed them more and they would have retained more. That, that was my own view. But back to my tale, this was 1988. Um, my dad and I had a conversation. I was home on holiday and he said, I've got this opportunity to buy a second store, um, but I'm not going to do it unless you're, you're up for it. Will you come back into the business? Um, I took all the 10 seconds to decide, yeah, a year, a year at Sainsbury's was enough for me, I needed, to, I needed to come back. Of course, I'd learned all these great things about running a big company. Uh, Sainsbury's had, we had to learn manuals as part of our graduate training. They had over 40 manuals that were all piled out in the, sto in the store manager's office, all lined up there with all the processes and procedures. And as a graduate trainee, we had to learn these. So I came back filled with all these ideas about how to run a big company um, into a very small company. We had the one store in Kinross and we bought a second store in Methil Hill. This was a convenience store. It was doing something like £8,000 a week. And when I think back, I think, why, why was I doing that? Why? I just, I, it's just one of these happy coincidences. At the time, I thought, what on earth are we doing here? Why are we taking on the small store? Because my idea was to operate bigger stores, because that's, that was what I, I felt more comfortable in. So we took on the second store. I was filled with manic energy. I really was. I may not look it now, but in my 20s, I really was quite energized. And uh, I'd be working long hours every day. And you know, in that first year, we got that, we doubled the sales in that store. Tremendous. <laughs> so, as, as is common in small businesses, the accountant takes your book, books away. This was the case in the 1980s. And a couple of months later, he comes back with the results. You, of course, have no idea how to, what the results are because you're so busy running the business. And to my absolute horror, I discovered that indeed was the second store not only... <laughs> We were losing money. We were losing money. Having this whole effort, we doubled the sales. And I was, as far as I was concerned, we hadn't increased the cost particularly, and it was profitable before we bought it. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I, I discovered a really valuable lesson and something I would suggest <coughs> you all might want to listen, particularly if you're going to run your own business. Um, and that is that... <laughs> You have to get control of that business. You have to know the numbers. You have to know where you are every week, every month. You've got to know these things. You would not believe the number of businesses out there who don't do that. Uh, if you don't know anything about accounts, make sure you get on a course and learn the basics about it. I can't stress that. Please, you don't need to learn all about the dreadful accounting conventions and standards and all that nonsense. But you do need to be able to look at accounts and make sure, one, you're making money, and two, you've got cash. I know that sounds really simple, but again, cash will come back and borrowing will come back. And I'm going to tell you about some of the details there. So I discovered to my horror that this store in Methil Hill that I doubled the sales in and put an awful lot of effort in wasn't making any money. We had no systems in place to identify why we weren't making any money, and... A lot of angst and heartache, eventually, we discovered that the person I had appointed the store manager was stealing, stealing from me big time. I reckon she probably took about £50,000 in that year. Um, and you might think, how on earth could somebody steal £50,000? 
Well, the answer is when you don't have systems and controls, quite easily, quite easily. We're a cash business. We were taking in about twenty thousand pound a week. It's quite easy if you don't, if you're not under, if that system is not under control. If you're not under control. So, I really had to sort that out and probably spent the next six months after sacking the store manager uh, working even harder, but starting to introduce financial controls to the business. And that, that was really important. And so we, 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 we marched on, we opened our, our, our third store and fourth store. And then something really, really quite significant happened. 1992, uh, you know, things were going well. Um, they had the four stores operating. And one of the multiples announced it was opening a store next to our main store in Kinross. Now, that was a major thing, thing for us. Um, you know, you suddenly see your whole livelihood <laughs> going. You, you, actually, you imagine the very worst. Before it happens, you imagine the very worst. You imagine that that store will have to close. And suddenly we're looking at these numbers myself, my dad, my sister, my mum, we're all in the business, all getting a living from that business, up to that point, quite a good living, and uh, all of a sudden that's all going to be taken away. Ladies and gentlemen, that's competition. And when I, at, at the time, I was kind of with all the other independent retailers saying, my God, it's terrible, it's not fair, this shouldn't happen, it's not right. And don't we hear that all the time from businesses who... Who are, who are having to adapt to new technology and new competition. And they all say it's not fair. Guys, get, get with it. This happens. And it was horrible this, in 1992 for months. I didn't sleep properly. I really was worried about it. Um, but I think looking back, it galvanized me. It made me realize I had to focus now on a business that had to be immune from the, the, the multiples as best I could. How was I going to tackle them? Because they weren't going to go away. They, we were going to have more of them. We were going to have more competition. How are we going to de develop a strategy which said, right, we're going to deal with this? And, and the answer was, we, we figured out that small stores actually made quite a lot of money. Small stores took their customers, usually from quarter of a mile radius, really small radius, um, we discovered, because we started doing some market research, we've all heard of that, well I didn't, I was too mean to pay for it to be honest, but I eventually did start doing that, and we discovered that these small stores, two thirds of our sales were coming from people who lived within a quarter of a mile, and they visited the store four, four or five times a week, they were coming in almost daily to use us, they, were, they used the big stores as well of course, but they were using us. And we found, hey, right, let's start finding locations. Maybe the, the, there aren't stores there just now, and let's put, it's all about the population. It's all about the population within the quarter of a mile. Now go back to, this is the early 1990s. There really wasn't people out there opening convenience stores. The cooperatives were in disarray, um, and there really wasn't anybody else doing it. And it was, it was and, but I wish I'd known that at the time, because I would have done, opened an awful lot more. <laughs> um, but that we realised then, so, so, so we started developing those, those other stores. And then we come to this next point in, your, in a business cycle. And that is, I'm running myself absolutely ragged. I had every kind of mobile phone. You, you lot probably won't even remember it, but I had a mobile phone that was like a briefcase. <laughs> because I was on the go all the time. I just was never in any one location. Mobile phones were a great idea. Absolutely great idea. Uh, and I've, I've had every mobile phone you could ever possibly imagine um, because I, I really needed it. But I got to that point where, in my late 20s, where I needed somebody else in the business. My, my payments, payments were withdrawing from the business. Um, reality was my sister, very loyal to me and a very hard-working person, wasn't the person who was going to take that business forward beyond myself. And so, of course, I fell into the trap that many of you will fall into of saying, I know, I'm in retailing, so I'm going to get somebody from Tesco or Marks and Spencers or Sainsbury's. I want them to come in and show me how, how, you know, what to do and turn us into a professional organisation. 
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I've got to tell you right now, that is a massive mistake. Why on earth would somebody who's building a career at Tesco or Sainsbury's or whatever want to come and work in a small family business? It's just not going to happen. And you get the people they rejected. And no wonder they rejected them. And I went through three senior people in about a year. It was a bloody disaster. The other thing I didn't do, of course, was I didn't interview them properly. I, 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 just, I was so busy and constantly on the go, I never had time. But I was, in, I was in one of our stores one evening, and I don't know what I was doing, something stupid probably. And, but I was talking to this chap who came in, and we were talking about retailing, and this guy, was, he seemed to know what he was talking about, and I quite liked the guy. And, you know, the conversation started off about 7 o'clock. I was still talking to him at half past 10, the store had closed, and we were just talking about all these things. And it turns out this guy had run his own business, a fruit and veg business, and uh, he was working for John Menzies. And it's just one of these things, and one of the great things about being a small business is you can make a decision like that, and it happens. And I, I offered him a job that night to come in as an operations manager. I don't know, I can't remember what his first title, he had so many titles over the years. Stephen Brown. I guess, became, within a year, the first non-family member of uh, the business, David Sands Limited, and ultimately he's, he's been with me and still a great, great friend. And, and one of the things we did very early was we gave him equity. And that's something I think is really important in small businesses. Um, I think it buys loyalty, and, and my goodness, we really got that from Stephen. And I remember saying to Stephen when, when we gave him the shares, he said, now Stephen, you know, I want you, I really want you to get a lot of money when we eventually sell up. And I was clear that at some point we would, we would sell up, don't know when. And we just sort of laughed about it and got on with the day-to-day the -day job. So, um, really important that you have to recognise sometimes you can't do everything yourself. And it's really important to get that other person. And I want to just tell you a little bit about recruiting and, and, and so on, because I think something you'll need to discover is that you'll all do personality tests, you'll all discover the kind of person you are. Um, by the way, I've got a very high risk tolerance, but I'm also a high extrovert and a high introvert. So I can stand up and talk about my business here, but if you want to engage me in chit-chat outside, you're wasting your time, because I'm just hopeless at it. I am socially awkward. Okay, <laughs> so uh, I'm just, and I was bloody awful at chatting up women, unfortunately. Um, but if you wanted to talk to me about how to make money, I might actually be okay at that. So, recruiting people. Know who you are. Know what kind of person you are. Now, in my case, I wasn't good at the softly, softly, nice, being a nice person, empathising with people. I'm very matter of fact, and this is how it is, and whatever. So what I tended to do was get people alongside me who complemented my skill set. I knew I was never going to change, and I would say this to you all, however you are just now, it's very unlikely you will change much from that. So if you're a really lovely people person, positive and cheerful and everything else, you will be. If you're not, you won't be, you, won't, you can't change that, I would say that. Um, know what your strengths are. And make sure if you're in a position to recruit other people, you get people who complement your skill set. So the business kept moving forward. Um, we managed to deal with the competition because we had to adapt and change to that competition in Kinross. And actually, within five years, our Kinross store was a back, back again being the most profitable store within the group. It's interesting. We never thought that would, that would, that would be the case. We moved on, we got to about eight or nine stores, and uh, we had Stephen in doing, he was as manic as I was, and we decided that we, we were getting store deliveries to, directly to stores, we decided to set up a central warehouse operation. So that, the idea was, if we can buy in bulk, and we can buy lots of different things from different people, and then distribute to stores, we can cut down on the storage space in stores, and, 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 and have a really efficient warehouse and buying operation. And instinctively, we, are we were traders and we saw ourselves as traders. So we love buying and selling. 
Um, and so that's what we did. We opened the first warehouse and ultimately in 1985 we built a completely new purpose-built um, warehouse um, and we introduced all sorts of wonderful technology. Now, happily at this time, I got married to somebody who had some great IT skills, just coincidentally. <laughs> and uh, we decided, we, 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 we saw some technology in America, voice technology, and it's very common now in warehouses, people go around with headsets. Believe me, um, 15 years ago it was not common. And we introduced voice technology. Um, which meant the guys in the warehouse orders would be automatically pulled in from stores because we had scanning EPOS in stores, so we knew what we had sold every night, and this, this thing would automatically create orders for the stores, and guys would pick it and they would put on their headset, log in, and the system would give them a job to do. And the system knew what job they had done first, so it might be replenishment, it might be picking, goods in, whatever. Anyway, anyone who tells you that IT projects will be no problem and it will be very smooth and whatever, it's bollocks. Absolute bollocks. If, just ask RBS about changing over some software. And tell, they'll tell you just some of the problems with that. Be prepared, if you're going to do a massive systems change in your company, be prepared um, for massive headaches. Be prepared for trouble. Be prepared for things not to happen not to work as they should. Um, and that's exactly what we got. We, we almost ground the company to, to a halt because it just didn't work to start with. And it was hard, hard work, believe me. There was a month of real pain and real trauma and, and people really losing it in, in every sense. My dad stormed out. He'd had enough. He said, that's it. I can't work this system. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, it was just a horrible time, but we stuck to it, and I knew things had got better, because so I got the warehouse team together. You can imagine telling a bunch of big eats in the warehouse, right guys, we're going to go away from picking lists, you're going to wear headphones, and it's going to tell you what to do. Yeah, right, boss, what do you know? Uh, so two weeks down the line, we've got all these people back in. Right guys, what do you think? We're going to stick with this voice system? Or are we going to uh, go on to stay, go back to paper? Not one person wanted to go back to paper, interestingly. Uh, remarkable, because they were the most conservative bunch you could ever get. And I knew things had come to a head when one morning I was talking to one of the guys in the US. Now remember, there's, there's a female voice in their head telling them. A very calm, collected female voice. <laughs> Hamish, this guy in the US said, he said, Ah, she's not feeling very well this morning. <laughs> she doesn't seem in a good mood. <laughs> yeah, whatever, anyway. <laughs> whatever. Okay, so we got this great system up and running. And we started. This is it. This is, this is the point where we got to about 14, 15 stores. We're starting to make some good money, around about three quarters of a million a year. And... Uh, we had this idea that I, 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 was, I was drinking heavily with somebody uh, one night who happened to be a management consultant, and he, he said to me, so what's your strategy? I said, strategy? I don't know. <laughs> to make a lot of money. Yeah, right, and how are you going to do that? Well, we could open more stores. Yeah, okay, and <clears throat> how are you going to do that? And so we got through a whole bunch, of, he, went, he took me through the A to Z of, of strategy. <clears throat> and coupled with the market research we had, we realised that by this time there was other people coming into the convenience space. Tesco were moving in, Sainz were moving in, um, the co-op were really starting to get, get, get their act together. Convenience was a known space and an attractive space. And, and there, there was us sort of sitting there sort of with a vague idea of going to open more stores, but that was about it. So we did, <laughs> we, we literally took a whole team away uh, for a couple of days and started to really talk about where did we want to go and how we were going to get there. And this was the first of my five year plans. I was like Stalin, I've got a five year plan. Um, <laughs> the, the point was that we started to figure out that we needed to try and make things in our business that we were really good at. Up until that point, 
in all honesty, we were functionally good, we had great sides, and we didn't have a lot of competition. So we kind of got away with a lot of things. That wasn't going to continue, and I suppose, was it cleverness on my part? Was it luck? I don't know. Just meet somebody and talk to somebody, I don't know. But we started to develop a strategy which says, okay, what are we really good at? What are we better at than other people? So we, we, we started to develop a partnership with local suppliers. Um, and we said, we absolutely, we are local. We are a Scottish company, we are Kinross based, we are Fife, we are Perthshire. What does that mean? We employ local people, so let's make a virtue out of that. Can we have the, bit, the most friendly, because we actually, and again, going back to the research, we discovered, we talked about price every single day. It was a fascination to us. We thought everybody who came into our stores knew the price of everything. Our researchers, and I questioned them, God knows how many times on this, we interviewed a thousand customers as they came out of our stores one March. And they, of the items they bought, they were asked to say what they had paid for things. Two thirds of them had absolutely no idea what they paid for items. Two thirds. You know when politicians get asked, oh, what's the price of a pint of milk? And they look a bit uncomfortable, and bread and whatever. Actually, they're actually representative of most of the population. I wonder how many of you know what you're paying for, probably beyond bread and milk, fags and alcohol. I wonder what you actually know you're paying for things. And the answer is actually, two thirds of you will have no idea what you're actually paying. And this was important because our focus needed to switch from price. We knew we needed to be known for value, but we also knew we had to be known for something else, something more important than that. So we, we discovered to our horror that customers wanted really good, fast and friendly service. We'd never measured this, we had no idea whether we were or weren't. So we really worked at this. We, we, we developed a customer care program. It was, we just invented it ourselves, but it was all about selling. And, and, and talking to customers. Now that might seem very obvious, but at the time you, we had you know, 500 people and we had to get them engaged in this. So every time a customer came in, they had to speak to that customer and not have a nice day, that kind of chat. It, they had to be natural. We also had to be insisted that they try and upsell. If you go into WH Smith, you know, they'll always try and sell you a large bar of chocolate. We did really crazy things like uh, are you interested in buying a melon today? Now, <laughs> I suspect not many people came into that store saying, I'm interested in buying a melon today. But we made the virtue of trying to sell really crazy things. Now, why did we do this? Well, one, it was a bit of fun. Two, we had competitions running all the time. But more than anything else, we were trying to create a culture of selling and having fun selling. And I think sometimes having fun is lost in business. Um, and I would say to you all that it's okay to have fun in business. Actually, it's a much more positive way to do things. So we got really involved in this upselling competition. And my goodness, sales started to really grow. We entered the competition and discovered, much to our amazement, that we won the title of the UK's friendliest stores. UK, plus. Hey, cool. We, you know, that, that was really good, really good. Uh, so, we started to develop some key strategies about friendly service, uh, local products, and, um, and this culture of selling in the business. We, we also introduced the bonus scheme at that point. We had bonus schemes before, but they were a bit erratic. And what I, what I introduced, and bonus schemes are really important, you all have them, whether you're an investment banker or whatever, you're all going to have a bonus scheme. Um, the first thing to do is to make it really simple. Everybody can understand it, and it's measured every month. What we did was, everyone in the business benefited from that, no matter what level. Yes, if you were a store manager, you would get more of a bonus than somebody who was a supervisor, but the fact was, you all had the same targets and everybody understood this. It was a common purpose, common purpose. And that's how we started to develop things. And it was very clear to us that we, we really got a lot of momentum behind that, because people really bought into that, and there was a lot of excitement going on uh, between stores and whatever. Some people couldn't cut it, 
They didn't get the bonuses. Their staff started complaining to us, we need a different manager because we're never going to get a bonus with this manager. Hey, that's interesting, isn't it? Uh, so much for loyalty. Um, so, we also started thinking about the kind of people that work for us. Um, and we really needed people with personality. If you're serving a customer, we really, do you know what? If you stand there saying, good morning, do you want to buy a melon? <laughs> And we all know it, we all see this, we see this. We need the people who would say, good morning, it's a great day today, isn't it? Uh, I bet you haven't thought about buying a melon just now, but would you like to buy a melon? It's like, would you like to try a taste of this melon? And it's about positive people. And so we really, I wasn't really interested in anyone's background or anything like that, but I really was interested in the, the attitude that they had, and the personality they had. And we started to develop tests when we were recruiting to make sure we had those those positive people. I'm conscious I've been talking for 35 minutes, so I just want to just talk about a couple more things and come on, come on to questions. Um, one thing you, you will all be faced with, you'll be asked for ideas. Your boss, or maybe yourself, you're running your own business. <gasps> what am I going to do? What am I going to do? One of the things we learned early on, and I was really passionate about, was going out and visiting the competition. Now, it's easy to knock your competitors. Our rule was, whenever we went into a store, and I encouraged everybody in the business to do this, and report back on it, um, was, what do they do better? What do they do better? And can we do that? Now, I'm not saying that is, we need to copy everything that Tesco does or whatever. What do they do better? And you, there's this awful phrase in retailing called retailer's detail, but it is about the real detail. What is it that makes that experience, why does that customer use that store and not our store? What are they doing that's better? And by constantly forcing that question, as opposed to, and I've been in, I, I, I did a RAN strategy session for a large Dundee retailer um, recently, and all the senior management team wanted to do was tell me why the Tesco, Tesco Express stores in Dundee were awful. I said, well, if that's the case, guys, they're beating you 10 times and turnover of profitability. So, you know, I think you're a bit delusional if you think they're not doing a better job than you. Um, and it's easy, but it's easy to become complacent, hubris to develop. Now, I wonder what conversations Tesco management are having just now. You know, they've been running, they've been, they've been at the forefront, and suddenly people are moving away from them. Now, do you accept that? How do you change that? Do you, and, and the first thing you've got to do is accept your reality. Um, and I think that will be very hard for a lot of people in Tesco, personally. Um, so get out, look for other ideas, talk to people. I, I love the fact, and I'm sorry I've forgotten your name, but you know, I, this, this young gentleman was telling me he started his own business and he needed to talk to me about something. I like that. And you know what, most people in business, don't be afraid to approach them and say, do you know what, I really think I could learn something from you. Could you tell me what? And you know, do that, do that all the time, wherever you are. People will like that, you'll stand out from the crowd. I tell you, in all my years, in all my years uh, as an employer, I have only once had somebody literally walk in off the street and say, can I have a job? Now that person stood out, just think about that, that person stood out. So if your dream job is working with X company, knock on the door, go and ask them. Don't give up, because you will stand out. <coughs> Two other things to talk about. Business, David Sandler, that was doing really well. Um, we started, we opened a new store in Dunfermline, and we spent a lot of money, it cost us about a million pounds to set this thing up. But it was different to other stores. <coughs> First of all, it had a lot of parking, it was bigger, and we created a lot of food for now, food to go, whatever you want to call it. In other words, you come into that store, we will be able to give you sandwiches or food that's freshly prepared in store for you to take away and eat there and now. It was very clear from day one that this formula really worked. And I thought to my horror, my God, most of our stores aren't like this. They're not in that kind of catchment. And it, it was a bit of an epiphany to say, this was where it was going to go. I was absolutely, I've been to the States, I'd actually spent a lot of time in the States. I worked in a, a chain in the States for a week. 
because I saw how they were developing and, and I thought this is where we are going to be. <coughs> Convenience stores are going to be different in the UK than what they are just now. They are very functional at the moment. You can go in and get a bag of sugar, tea, coffee. I'm not sure you can get a great snack from most of them. Um, you'll get a Mars bar, crisps, that's that sort of level. So I was thinking, my God, you know, how what are we going to do here? Um, we've, we've we've got kind of we're going to run two different businesses. I was approached by the cooperative. They wanted to buy the business. Of course, I said no, it's not for sale, which it wasn't. Um, they mentioned the price. I said thanks, no thanks. They approached me again, mentioned the price, which was considerably higher than the first one. I said thanks for that. Let's keep the door open, but no, I'm not interested. Not interested in selling. He came back a third time and offered me a huge amount of money, enough money for me to retire and to look after my family. I've got three kids. Their, their future would be secured if I take, took that offer. Can I tell you that selling something that you've spent your life to that point building is the most difficult decision that I've ever made in my life. Um, it took me many months to come to a conclusion. There was arguments for and against. I have lots of lists of for and against why I should do this. Um, I was quite convinced that we could take the business in a different direction and, and, and build it again, if you like. Um, down this food to go model. But eventually, I guess you're 45, I was 45 at the time, and suddenly that financial security, and I think it's when you have kids that you're, you're up to that point, I wasn't, you know, I would take any risks that were going, and it didn't really matter to me. I could survive on 10 grand a year if I had to, it wouldn't bother me. But all of a sudden, life changes, and, and the market was changing. This was 2008. And, uh, well, that's the way it started. You can remember all this recession and all that sort of stuff. We had two years where we had no growth in sales. Margins were coming under pressure. And I, I must admit, there was a bit of, I had a bit of a wobble as well. Just, I, you know, the business had got to such a size. Um, and, of course, there was a that family connection. I was fifth generation of the, the family to be involved in retailing. Why on earth would you sell, sell that? So a really difficult decision, and as ever with these things that are right and wrongs, I took the money. <laughs> uh, and it's a funny thing, um, I went through six months of dealing with lawyers, I started to speak like a lawyer, oh God help me. <laughs> I really did, I used to start talking about sub clause 4, subsection 6, <laughs> all that sort of nonsense. And then once we got through the, the agreement, um, the, 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 the deal was referred to the, the, the OFT. And God, we had to go through another uh, four or five months of absolute tender hooks. By this time, it had become public. So you can imagine facing your staff. People that I had worked with you know, all my life. And, and, and you know, I, I, luckily, we put in some provisions. So people with long-serving staff were rewarded as a result. Um, Poor, not poor, not poor, but Stephen, who had been with me all these years, um, I, I should say, is, has, was well rewarded, and he, he shook my hand and said, you did what you said you were going to do, uh, it's fabulous, and we have a great, great relationship to this day. I can tell you this, that I was exhausted after six months, that six-month process. Um, the day the money came through, it was a Tuesday, and I felt absolutely nothing, nothing. I didn't go to the ATM and say, I'm there. <laughs> uh, I did want to print it out, but I thought, no, no, I wouldn't do that. Uh, and, I, 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 and the funny thing was, and I guess like many entrepreneurs, I had absolutely no idea what I was going to do. I sat, I didn't have an office to go to, I had nowhere to go. What was I going to do? I, it never occurred to me to go off on holiday or buy a Ferrari or do all that kind of stuff. I, 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 I sat, I remember on the Tuesday, with my laptop and thought, right, what are we going to do now? <laughs> the work ethic, it hits you, it always is, it's always there. Um, so within a month, I bought several properties, um, I bought some building sites, and I've got some partners, and now I'm back in retailing, I have a new venture called David's Kitchen, I opened the first store in Glenn Office. I've got another retail venture in Musselburgh, we're on the first store there at the moment. David's Kitchen is going to open its second store. I have three building companies, uh, one that builds traditional houses, quite 
high, high, high scale. Thanks very much, John Swinney, for your new tax. Um, <laughs> and we build eco homes. They're really interesting. We've got some really interesting products for retirement <coughs> climate market just now. And I, I develop properties and rent, rent them out and do all that sort of stuff. And I invest. I invest in all sorts of companies, often badly. Uh, I've you know, made a few mistakes there with, with, with startups and all sorts of stuff. Um, but I manage my kids' funds. My, each of my kids have got a fund and I manage that. When they're 13, they will start to manage that because I firmly believe you've got to bring education. You've got to get everyone understanding you know, about financial matters. Uh, and I'm a great believer in that. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm conscious of time, but there's just one more thing I would say to you all. You're all sitting there very earnest. Um, I hope some of what I've said means something to you. Um, but I will tell you this, that I had many episodes in my life where I really was working hard. And uh, it, it was to my detriment in many ways. I made irrational decisions. Uh, I suffered from stress. I didn't realise it at the time because I was so busy. And I would say to you all that you, you will find yourself probably under a lot of pressure in your life. And I would say, just pace yourself. And if you, think you're under, if you think you're starting to suffer from stress, shout out and say something about it. Um, because most people don't, and it can really affect your judgment. And I would say, look after yourself. Um, take some exercise. You don't need to go manic at the gym, but you know, walk to work. Do whatever it is. I'm not going to say, don't drink. Because uh, that's not going to happen, is it? But, you know, look after yourself. And don't, don't turn up at work with horrendous hangovers because you won't perform. You simply won't. The, the thing about my age is, I know that now. Um, trouble is, in my 20s, I didn't realise it. The fact that I couldn't perform wasn't, was nothing to do with it. So, I just say, look after yourself. Try and look after what you eat. Um, try and make sure you sleep well and you will perform better and you will enjoy your life better because I see too many of my friends who work exceedingly hard burn out, absolutely burn out. Um, and I really would, would urge you that, you know, by all means work hard, but you become, you know, if you're at the top of your profession uh, in business, you are that, you think about an athlete, you are in that person, why the hell would you not look after yourself? Because you will not perform otherwise. Um, and stress can really, really hit you uh, at times. So, one other thing about business, and right through, is uh, just have a common sense approach. Really, businesses are about looking after customers and looking after people. And don't lose sight of that. And all the stuff you do, studying management, whatever, don't forget, we need common sense. And, <clears throat> you know, the truth is, the banking crisis, if only a few people in the banking world had a bit of common sense, we might not have got into the mess that we had. If you get involved in something you don't understand, get out of it. I was asked to take, I was on a board for a while of a company, it was a training company, and their money used to come from government funding, and I couldn't understand it. After three months, I still could not understand this company. It bamboozled me. And I eventually turned around to them and said, guys, Thanks for the opportunity. I'm sorry, I don't think I can add any value here because I just do not understand it. Well, it turns out that the chief executive was embezzling funds and he was, he was causing this huge confusion in the numbers. Thankfully, I was well out of it. And thank goodness, because it could have tarnished my reputation. Don't get involved in things you don't understand. It, will, it, it just, just always ends in tears. Um, so... That's a little bit of, of my life to date. Uh, I've gone over things, a lot of things, uh, very quickly, but I have tried to emphasise some of the points where I probably went wrong in life and some of the lessons that I've, I've learned. But of course, um, I'm very interested to hear if you've got any questions because that probably generates more debate. So I open the floor to questions. Yeah. Yes. No, no, perfect. Um, I, mem I made a note when uh, when you were talking on, in your early days when you were working that you in for a Sainsbury for a, for a big company, sort yes. of, and then you turned back and start developing for, so, sort of like a small shop. Yeah. Um, 
I wonder, you know, like because for us as students, there's always that fork, you know, that decision: are we going to first work and co even if we want to create our own companies, our yeah. startups, there's this fork decision: like, are we going to commit ourselves for several years and work in a big companies to yeah. get that big company experience, or start straight away and learn as we go? Yeah. What was the bigger benefit? For example, that one year in a big company because eventually you you went and work on that on something which has a different I would say like management strategy if you got a small piece yeah. of money. Yeah. And well yeah. Okay. No, and just um or if it was like for example that the person eventually like uh, who would start talking to you about the strategy was actually like just there and yeah. Uh, um I think it's a great question. The answer, uh, the answer comes in many parts. What I would say is, if you really want to make a lot of money, you've got to own your own business. Uh, because if you work for somebody else, then the shareholders and others are going to be making that money. Um, but you can learn an awful lot from big companies, an awful lot. Um, you can build a network. Some people simply aren't entrepreneurs, but fantastic managers. And you need to get to that point where you know yourself. What, are you the person, are you a risk taker? Are you comfortable with that? Or do you prefer the security? But by the way, what's job security nowadays? You guys will have at least 16 different jobs on average before you, you, you retire. And you'll be retiring in your 70s, uh, thanks to the current generation who's spending all your money. You're going to be retiring in your 70s. You're going to have 16 different jobs. So I don't think this idea of you know, going to one employer is, I don't think that's going to work anymore. I think you may be more comfortable in a co corporate setting because you don't actually, you don't want to take such high risk, and that's great. You could do really well. The, the risk taker who goes the other path, maybe after spending a few years at a bigger company, will have a, a roller coaster, <laughs> a roller coaster right? You may be successful, you may not. You will have almost certainly some tremendous failures along the, that, that journey. Um, and it depends what you get. What are you satisfied doing? What gets you passionate? Um, and I would say that that's really important. You know, you're a long time working, so make sure you're working something that's something you really enjoy. Uh, so if you're setting up your own business and you are passionate about it, then I would suggest to you, your chances are you'll succeed. If you go into it half-hearted, I don't think it's going to work. Um, if you want to stay in a big company, great. Take all the opportunities. But I, I think really important, if, you know, if I was starting off again, my feeling would be I'd be going to North America or Asia. I was in Hong Kong last year. Oh, my goodness me. You will talk about a place where you can do anything you want. Tax is 10%. <laughs> uh, but don't, don't fall sick. Okay, because there's no benefits, there's no welfare, there's nothing. Uh, but by the way, Hong Kong's had the best economic growth of any country in the world over the last 50 years. Hmm, that gets you thinking, doesn't it? Um, so, my sense is, if I was going starting again, and I'm, I'm telling my kids, one of my kids is doing Mandarin just now, uh, I, I reckon Asia's the place. If you want to go somewhere in the world and, 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 and make money, Yes. Sorry. Yes. Maybe <laughs> uh, Well, I want to ask you a question about how actually to start. You start as a family business, so yeah. it was quite right forward. And <laughs> you, I mean, you you feel your your family is partners, but I have a feeling that it's quite difficult when you have an idea and you think, oh, it could work, yeah. and then what are you gonna do with this idea? Who to approach? Where to find partners? It feels like you're alone in this field. So I'm, I'm telling you about that Tuesday. And okay, I had plenty of money. But it was a long time, the Tuesday after the sold my business, it was a long time since I'd set up a company. And I was sitting on that Tuesday saying, right, uh, I kind of want to do a property business. How do I do all that again? And I, I literally had to sit down. <coughs> and, and with yourself, you know, what am I going to do? How am I going to do it? And it's about doing all those little jobs and, and building some momentum. And the hardest thing is sitting in a room. I remember a guy, a Dundee guy, who, who sadly died, a guy, Eddie Thompson. Eddie Thompson used to be chairman of Dundee United. Um, Eddie left the security of a well-paid senior job 
with a Dundee wholesaler called Watson and Philip, not around anymore, it doesn't matter. And he, I remember him telling me he set up a convenience store chain. We were kind of competitors, but we were quite friendly. And he, his first day, he had no money. No money, just an idea. He maybe had about 50 grand. Uh, but building a convenience store, you're not going to get very far with 50 grand. He sat, I remember he, he hired an office in Brodsey Ferry, and he sat at a desk. And he thought, my God, what have I done? <laughs> I used to have a secretary, I had PAs, I had this, I had that. I'm on my own, and he sat there, and he had a telephone and a pad, and within 10 years, he sold that business for 20 million pounds. Now, it's hard, but you've just got to get on and do it. Just got to do it. Just, if you believe in it passionately, it'll happen. But you'll get lots of rejections. Um, you'll get lots of rejections from banks and investors and all that sort of stuff. I go back to, are you passionate about what you do, or do you not really care? Because I'll tell you one thing. If, I, if you stood in front of me, I would be able to tell in minutes whether this person was passionate about what they did. And most investors with money know that as well. So if you're passionate and you're determined, then give it a go. Give it a go. What's to lose? What's to lose? You had, sorry, you had a question, then I'll come to you, sir. Yeah. How much time did you spend on research, on learning from other companies in order to improve your own? Yeah, yeah, a lot. The answer was a lot, but the answer is also not, not enough. enough. <laughs> not enough. I would try and get out a day a week, one day a week. Um, and I, I, we, we really got into the research. It was, it was fascinating to, to, to read, you know, to, to look at the research, what, what our customers were telling us about. I mean, if it's your business and you're passionate about it, you want to know what your customers are, are telling you. And we, we ran focus groups and all sorts of things just about, you know, what are people saying? What do they like? What do they not like? But I, I was never afraid, not, well, being a shy person, it was a, you know, in my early days, it was all, I always found it difficult to approach other retailers and say, you know, we've got a problem with this. How do you deal with it? But generally, I found very early, people were always keen to talk. And I, I, I don't think, the only company, get this, the only company that refused to help me in 25 years was Tesco. The only company. Um, well, interesting. Interesting. Does that answer your yeah. question? No, sir. Yes, you've mentioned that you've recently started uh, three or four new businesses. Yeah. And how do you make sure you spend enough time on each of them and don't lose focus on one of them? Maybe uh, you focus on one specific business, it does well, and the other don't do well. Do you have four cell phones and make sure you keep uh, one cell phone for each, uh, or if you have lots of medians that take care of <laughs> I have a PA in Fairness who came from my, my last, from David Sands Limited, who's been great. She, she sat at the other side of the dining room table for a long time. We built some offices beside my house now, and so, so she works with me. I refuse to get bogged down in detail now. I'm not interested, I'll, I'll be honest, you know. So I might have got bogged down in detail before, but if somebody comes, if, if somebody can't explain something to me quickly, or write it down on one page, a sheet of paper, I'm not interested. Um, make it simple, and, and no, I'm not going to get involved in day-to-day -day stuff. So in the businesses that I'm involved with, I don't want them building. I am not a builder. I'm not a qualified builder. Do I want to hear about the virtues of aluminium gutters and plastic gutters? No, bloody no. Uh, I, do I want to know are we selling these? What a customer, what are our existing customers saying about the houses? Are they happy with them? Um, are we making money? So I try. So what I try and do is. I start with, I kind of like holidays now. I didn't get enough holidays when I was young, so I kind of do holidays now. Um, I like working three or four days a week, but no more than that. And I try and structure things so, yeah, what happens typically in businesses is sometimes a business needs a lot of time, you know, because something happens. And you, you have to get right in there and deal with that. But at other times, you agree something, and you trust the people around you to get on with it. And you remember what you agreed, you make sure you've got good minutes and say, right, okay, we agreed that, have we done that? No, why not? <laughs> and, and you have those discussions. But it's an art, and I'm not sure I'm, not sure I'm great at it. Um, but I, 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 try, I try and do the, the sort of people thing. 
to uh, my business partner in one of the bus businesses. I tend to partner up with people who have the experience or whatever. And so I'll be doing the investment, and I'll, but I tend to look after the finances. Um, but this guy had gone bust in 2008, a property developer, wasn't unusual. I got him started again. Now, for him, when he sold his first house, that was the first house he had sold in four or five years. He'd been through a personal bankruptcy. I remember I, I said, you know, Colin, that's brilliant. You must be so proud selling that house today. Fantastic. And, and, and he, he literally burst into tears. Um, and and it, was, it was just, you know, it was a big moment. And I knew it would be a big moment for, for him. So it's sometimes about just that encouragement, that, that, that human touch, if, if, if you like. Um, that can that can be important. So I'm not sure I've answered your question because I ask my I ask myself every week how am I spending my time am I am I spending my time wisely um, or not? This idea that spending time with your family more time with your family uh, it doesn't work for me if I'm really honest. It's, I like my family very much, but do you know what the idea of spending too much time with them? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if they would want me to spend too much time with them either. But, so uh, the idea, of, the idea that I was going to sell the business, spend a lot more time with my family, no, that was that wasn't going to happen. <laughs> I promise you, that wasn't going to happen. And anyone that says that, I don't believe it. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, that's uh, quite inspirational. Um, just one thing: when things were going rubbish, yeah, which they inevitably did yeah. at some point, when things were going rubbish, what was it that, that, that kept you going? Yeah, I mean, they do, they do. You know, when you go through a period of your sales and maybe fall back a little, I mean, we live by Monday morning sales. I had to have them on my desk at 7 o'clock in the morning. I needed to know how we perform. By that point, latterly, I had a big team, and, you know, they all look to you. <laughs> so when things aren't going great, you know, how are you going to do? Are you going to come out saying, bloody hell, that's bloody awful? Or are you going to say, well, you know, it wasn't too, you know, right, what are we going to do this week? You've got to galvanise people all the time, even although you feel bloody awful. You want to go on the Sunday night, hide behind the couch and say, oh, God, I can't face it. Because honestly, there are times when I was like that. You know, I just, you know, let me watch Mother of the Glen. I'll stay here. I don't want to, I don't want to go to work. But you've got to galvanise people. You've got to say, okay, you know, that was last week. What are we doing this week? And continually be positive about about things. That's and it's not easy. It really is not easy. Um, but people look to you as a leader. And all of, most of you in this room, I'm sure, will be in that leadership position at some point. So, however, whatever your demeanour, no matter how awful things are, people will look to see how you react. That's why I say, look after yourself. Look after yourself. Make sure you're physically fit and mentally fit. Um, because these, when these tough times come, you have to be in that place. You absolutely have to be in that place. Um, I don't know if that answers the question. It's a great question. That's good. Great question. Yes, anyone up the back here, or is it? Or is it all the SWATs at the front? <laughs> yes. Yes, yes. Do you find time to give back to society? What do you mean by that? Uh, for example, do you, for example, what do you do right now that's giving back to society by talking to young people who want to establish people? Yeah. When I was working, I was bloody selfish. I I worked, and that was about it. Uh, our company did quite a lot actually in communities. We really believe one of our great <coughs> things was if all our customers are going to live within quarter of a mile, we better be a bloody good neighbour and be absolutely the hub of the community. So from, from a corporate point of view, we probably did quite a lot. As an individual, no. But one of the things I was adamant about when I sold the business was that I wanted to get more involved in society because I was divorced from society <laughs> in many respects. So one of the things I do now is I kind of like the outdoors. And I'm a, I'm a leader with a, a, a Duke of Edinburgh group. And I, 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 do, I go on expeditions, I help kids out on, on expeditions, which I like, it's, it's good fun. Funnily enough, it's a great way to identify potential leaders, um, just because when people are under physical pressure, uh, you tend to find you know, the truth comes out. It's quite interesting that there's a dynamic, and it's the most 
the people you don't expect to start with, after they've been hiking for four days, and they're camping in the rain, the wind, and the midges, and all that sort of stuff, you see who the true leaders are. Quite interesting. But, so I do a lot of that. Um, I get involved in various charities. Uh, I, I, I do a lot. Our family, family does, does quite a lot as well. Um, I got involved, believe it or not, in the Better Together campaign. Uh, I don't want to go on about the referendum tonight, but I felt very strongly against independence, so I, I got involved in the debates. I was, I was debating as part of that, and I'm very much part of that campaign. Um, so, but I don't do enough. The answer is I don't do enough. Um, and that's why I'm delighted to come along tonight and, and you know, hopefully pass on some knowledge. Yes. David, can you talk a bit about funding? Because growing a business like the retail, in the retail sector, can be pretty cash intensive. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I think you guys are going to have it, have it really tough when you go out and you have your business idea and you go to banks now. Um, there was a period um, 10, 15 years ago where it was quite easy to raise money. Uh, it's not easy anymore. It really is not easy anymore. Um, what I'm really interested in now is, particularly in small startups, and maybe thinking about you, is this peer to peer lending and, and, and the new. You know, I, I, I was listening to some of the bank chief executives dishing this peer to peer lending. I don't know, but I kind of think there's a bit of momentum behind this, and it's very, very interesting. I'm involved in it in a small way. I've done a couple of small investments on it. Uh, I've got some good returns, you know, it seems all right. So I think it's going to be really difficult. And I think banks, I'm afraid, won't learn the lessons. Uh, so a few years from now, it will probably get a little bit easier. It will get easier and easier and easier, and then we'll have another bank. It, it happens. I've been through two bank crashes in real slumps. Um, interestingly, in 2008, we had a very profitable business, but we were borrowing extra money because we were about to make quite a big acquisition. We were with Bank of Scotland. I, our family had been with Bank of Scotland for four or five generations. <coughs> And uh, I remember calling them in, calling them in, and saying, uh, guys, everything's okay, this was right about August. Everything's okay, there's no problem, you know, you, you know I'm going ahead, the acquisitions, everything else. Oh, yeah, 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 fine. So I phoned them up just as a courtesy. Now, remember, the, the offer's going in on Friday, you know, I'm going to need whatever it was, one and a half million. He said, ah, this is October. He said, ah, I said, what do you mean, ah? Uh, it'll have to go to credit committee. I said, well, we've already got a letter passing it. Um, now, bear in mind, we didn't have a lot of borrowing. We were a profitable business, strong asset base. Um, I said, what do you mean by that? He said, well, I can't guarantee the funds. I said, wait a minute, I'm putting an offer in in a few hours. <laughs> I need that money. Uh, and uh, he said, well, you know, I'll need to get back to you. And of course, literally over that weekend, the whole banking system collapsed completely. It was that weekend. What a time. And I remember the next week, I had to arrange, hastily arrange five meetings with different banks. I did a pitch to them all. Thankfully, they all offered me money, and I, had to, I moved back. So I was with Bank of Scotland all those years. That's it, wiped out. I don't believe you have long-term banking relationships anymore. <coughs> Um, I mean, all these glad handing, all these events I used to go to, um, guys, <laughs> remember, it's their money and they can pull it away from you any time they want. They're not obliged to keep your business afloat. And please remember that. It's their money, it's not your money. So don't think that your bank is a friend for life. That's how I was brought up. It's, they're not friends for life, they're friends for the minute, the time. Uh, you, there's, but the, the great thing is the banking world changing, we've got peer-to-peer -peer lending, we've got lots of angel investors out there, some really good tax advantages for people to invest in startup companies, better than they've ever been before, um, and we've got new entrants into the banking market. I bank with a bank called Handels Banking, I've never heard of them, <laughs> four or five years ago, they've got 170 branches in the UK. If you don't know anything about them, read up about them. It's a fantastically interesting model, completely different to UK banks, completely different. Um, and guess what? When you phone them up, you speak to an individual. You don't speak. I hate call centres. Handles Banking, the Swedish bank. Handles Banking. 
Really, really interesting model. Uh, great place to go if you're going to go into banking. Great place to go because you'll get real decision making quite quickly. Uh, it's not done by computer there. Really interesting model. So, very difficult, <coughs> going to be difficult, but lots of new avenues that are just starting. I have a feeling peer-to-peer -peer lending is going to be a really big thing. And I think a lot of you guys might benefit from that going, going forward, because I think you'll really struggle with banks. Are we, are we time? Are we? Thank you for the, for such a great talk. I hope that everyone of you enjoyed as much as I did. Uh, here is a small souvenir from Enterprise Gym. I hope you will find it useful. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs>